I'd like to connect as a medical center for the live demo. Okay. Dr. Buck, we okay. see you on the screen. Yeah, right. This, uh, this, uh, I, we prepared another the complex uh, lamb main case and the uh, instant restenosis case. And uh, our team is uh, Dr. Zhou and the uh, technician Zhang is involved. And uh, we're going to show the, some complex region how to treat uh, simply. Okay, the Dr. Zhou, Zhou? can yeah. you explain the patient uh, the history? Okay, uh, this case, this, uh, <clears throat> this patient is a 70 years old gentleman. He was admitted for the apple delayed chest pain. Uh, actually, uh, 18 years ago, he underwent PCI at proximal to mid LAD. And one month ago, we did a chorioangiography, and chorioangiography showed the left main disease with proximal to mid LAD ISO lesion and DP stenosis at proximal to mid RCA. At that time, we did a PCI to the, at the RCA lesion. So with the <coughs> Giants uh, DS, and uh, we plan to still uh, revasculation at the left main to uh, mid LAD. Oh, next. Okay, next. Uh, this is a uh, demographic characteristic. He has a diabetes and, oh, he has diabetes and smoke. He's a current smoker. Next one. Okay, so if I'm gonna summarize this patient nearly uh, 18 years ago and uh, received the uh, bare metal stand S670, and uh, today do we have a history section. I don't know exactly what is the S670, and I, the, I'd like to hear some comment from uh, <laughs> SW Park about the X, S670. So, and this patient has a right coronary region, and uh, we, a couple of days ago, we already underwent uh, uh, the PCI, and the, our targeting is uh, today's lamb main and LAD. This is uh, looking at the uh, RAO coral view, uh, we uh, easily find that there was some, you know, the distal lamb main is, looks like ulceration and the uh, rupture and the sucker ostium is a wide angle. And uh, looking at the distal part of the suck, there was some disease and not significant. And so the, it's unfortunately we just focus on the LAD and lamb main. Next. This is the distal main view, and uh, there are some hazardness, and there are acute angle, and the wide angle, the LAD ostium, and suck, and uh, so the, that means uh, wiring seems to be not easy. Definitely, it was take time, and uh, next. Looking at the, the previous uh, the stand, is there was some diffuse ISR, S670, is there is, I know, some uh, uh, you know, some the hybrid form is cube type and also the, in the helixial type. And uh, we can find the distal part is a very diffuse uh, uh, region and the, there, is a, there is no optimal, uh, looks like a landing zone. And also the, there was some diagonal disease and next. So, and uh, looking at the diagonal branch, is a very, looks like a very complex, it's a, a very tight stenosis of diagonal branch. And the diagonal branch, not so small, is definitely, I think, a, the big size of diagonal branch. And so, and the diffuse uh, uh, ISR region, the distal lamb main disease, and the distal the part of, of stand, the prior stand was diffuse, the disease is uh, uh, very uh, difficult to treat and uh, decide to optimal strategy for patient. So I'd like uh, some the comment from panel or uh, the moderator about uh, what is the optimal plan for this patient. Okay, okay. any comment? Yes, we have uh, uh, many distinguished faculty members uh, for discussion. Would you start? I, I think the biggest challenge here is going to be dis to decide what not to stent. Um, at least okay. as I... Okay. Uh, you know, I don't think we have seen the very proximal osteal part of the LAD angiographically. But from what we've seen, I think you can safely work in the distal LAD, get that part taken care of, then come back, make your decision as to whether you want to tackle the ISR or leave it alone. And then after that, go after the left main itself. So... Distal, mid to distal LAD first. You have to decide how long an area you want to stent. 
then make a decision about the mid LED and diagonal, and then work on the left main. Other comments? This is actually, yeah. Uh, hello, Dr. Park. Yes. Uh, this is Akasaka. How are you? Yeah, how are you? Yeah, it's how are you? <laughs> yeah, actually, this is a, a very complex region, so we have to divide the two parts, as you said, uh, distal LED, and also the, the, the instant, some instant uh, yes. tissue proliferation, yeah, and right. uh, the, the just proximal to left main. Yeah, so, right. In our daily clinical practice, uh, we always use an uh, imaging. Therefore, first we dilate distal portion and then yeah. get an yeah. image. Often yeah. we use an uh, OCT. Yeah. But, but if you try to use an uh, IBUS, you can do the IBUS without uh, pre dilatation sometimes. But yes. uh, anyway, a distal region treatment is fast. And then yeah, getting yeah. image, we decide yeah. uh, how to treat. Uh, yeah. instant proliferation, <coughs> proliferation and just proximal to the left main. And yes, also, yes. as you said, uh, the diagonal branch, the, the proximal, there are some disease and uh, within an instant uh, pro proliferation, therefore, <coughs> and the angle is very narrow and uh, there might be the, some risk to occlude yeah, yeah, if you yeah, simply dilate within yes. the uh, stand. Yeah, yeah. So, right. right. It's my comment. Okay, there is, a, you know, some the very, you know, good uh, suggestion is, uh, you know, some, I, I have a connection with uh, Dr. Akasaka, I did uh, like that, <laughs> yeah. So, okay, and uh, at this moment, and, uh, you know, some, the previous view, and then the, we can see the Pax LED, previous view, the, the first view, the epicoral view, there was some very hazardous and the tile region and the, the, and the next, and next, the initially we do a 2.0 balloon to dilate the uh, distal part of portion, and initially the wire passage is not easy. And next, we uh, the support was pine cross, and then the, this is the uh, the the field of FC wire, and then take time is an acute angle that we make a U shape, and then is make a talk and the, to the LED part. And the angle is uh, very acute, it's uh, take time to the passage to the LED, and then fortunately the past that region. And then the, I the, try to push the fine cross to the LED, it's take time, and the next. And then we the past the digital part of the LED, this is a fine cross wire, and then the, I, the, the, the digital part was very tight, so uh, the, I the pass the, uh, the field FC wire and then the put the fine cross and then the change the long the power turn wire for the extra support and then next and then the, the we, I put the another the wire to the keep the diagonal branch and next and it's a take all time and the next. So at the keep the diagonal branch and they're looking at this view and the distal part of the LED is very tight and also <coughs> diagonal branch it looks like a very tight and also distal main is a very tight it's almost it's a very the ugly morphology and then next and then we do this is two point zero balloon and then we check the uh, intravascular ultrasound Can, could, could you show us the intravascular ultrasound? Okay, the, this is a distal part of the LED. It's a vessel size of 2.7, 2.5. It's a plug. It's definitely difficult to define the how long we are gonna stand the distal optimal portion. It's very difficult to find the optimal portion. And the, the plug was huge, and this is the distal part of the prior S67 general bell metal stand. And then the, we can see the uh, huge plug is a distal part. And uh, this is a very tight portion. Uh, okay, this is the distal part. Okay, okay. Uh, this is a, we can see some uh, the calcified region of there. Okay, next. Okay, uh, here is part is a prior. We put the bare metal is a uh, three zero millimeter and the uh, three point five. And then looking at the okay, let's play. Have a it's a prior stand, the intimal hypoplasia 
uh, was severe, and the, the, this is 18 years ago, the uh, stand. Could I make the proximal part of the stand? Okay, okay, this is the added osteum. This is the uh, proximal the part of a prior bell metal stand. We can see very tight portion. And also, we can find uh, uh, the very, you know, some tight uh, region of the added osteum. And then sucker is coming over here. Added osteum disease is very severe. And also, disease was uh, definitely extended to the red main. This is uh, some rupture and the red main size more than 4.0. And then the plug was definitely extended to the uh, red main osteum. That so there, there is, there is our. I was finding any, any comment for that. Is that a single layer of stent in the mid LAD? There were some cuts that looked as though there may be two layers. It's a little hard to tell from here whether that's stent plus calcium, or two layers of stent yeah, already. Yeah. Probably just the, the one stent, right? So uh, the my strategy is that I try to avoid the. Too much stand overlap. Even though we're gonna treat the uh, prior bell metal stand, is a, there is a, many options. Is the an additional bell, the drug learning stand and the cutting balloon, just the balloon angel plastic or a drug corridor balloon. There are many options. For our strategy, prefer the strategy just to try to avoid the, the, the too much stand overlap. And so the, my strategy was a digital path. Is optimally additional stand to cover the native basal progression and the proximal part to the uh, proximal area to land main is that I put the additional stand and then middle part I try to the uh, draw coated balloon. So and next, so we did the uh, 2.0 balloon and then next, and then this is a slightly the dilated and next. The we do diagonal branch balloon. This is 2.0 compliant balloon. And next, it's relatively it's okay. And the next, and the, with the we evaluate again the, the how much how long the implant the uh, drug eluding stand. And next, and then the this is one zoom. You can see it's very difficult to define the the distal the the landing portion is a diffuse disease. Next. And then the, we uh, decide the measure. This is a uh, ultimate 2.75, 38 millimeter, and the, the try to uh, overlapping the distal part of the stand. Next, and this is one zoom, and next, and then the implant the 2.75, and then next. Okay, this is uh, looks like okay. The one zoom next. <coughs> And then the middle part is that we find the very you know tough uh, uh, the neurointimal hyperplasia the ISR. So the two modified the plug prior neurointimal hyperplasia. We do the plug modifying strategy. We something do scoring balloon. We something do uh, the cutting balloon. Sometimes a very calcified the severe region. Sometimes we do rotavulation. So we also now doing some active random trial. To, for treatment of ISR region, it's a randomization, just the one arm is a balloon angel plus, the one arm is a balloon plus uh, some rotavulation. So this is a 3.0 cutting balloon that we do the meticulous uh, balloon dilation using the cutting balloon. And next, over here, the 3.0 cutting balloon. Next, 3.0 cutting balloon. And next, the three balloon. Yeah, okay, so it looks like a much, much improved the lumen, the, uh, the area, okay, next. <coughs> and then the, we do uh, additional the high pressure balloon dilation using 3.5 uh, non compliant balloon to, you know, some modified, more optimized uh, the overall the ISR region the before final the adaption of the drug corridor balloon. And next. And then this is 3.5 non compliant balloon. And then next. 3.5 non-compliant balloon, 3.5 non-compliant balloon, we do up to remain. Next, <coughs> next, next, the, we do 3.5 non-compliant balloon, and then we, the, the distal part, we do additional balloon using 2.75 non-compliant balloon, and next, do 2.75 non-compliant, 2.75 non-compliant, 
2.75 non-current band next. And then the remain the REM main region is a, the, the definitely the procedural, the angiographic result is okay up to now and next. And then we try to fully cover the REM main. This is a 4.0. The 24, the ultimaster, and the, this is the area cranial view. We check the spiral view, the area coral view, shallow area view, and then the put the, the ultimaster stand. And then next, we inflate 4.0, and then the slightly pull back the additional balloon, and then next. Okay, so it, I'm gonna, the, at this moment, is that we did some the wiring again to the diagonal branch. Okay. Okay, 여기서 한번 찍어보자. Enjoy. Push up. Okay, I think the result is okay. The, up to now, any comment or suggestion or the, another opinion for that? The flow of the diagonal looks very, very good and uh, yeah. you don't want to touch that, right? Yeah, right, right, right. Just uh, I just uh, do is a final kissing balloon for that region. Is the, uh, the 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 now is uh, uh, we require the more additional balloon, uh, high pressure balloon for land main region. This is the uh, additional 4.0 non-compliant balloon. And then I'm gonna apply for land main part. Doctor Bob, what do you think about applying the DB to the the diagonal? Uh, DB, yeah, that is good option. Yeah, so we can do that. We can do that. Uh, even though the side branch is sometimes we treat the drug luring balloon and it, it's a big branch. Yeah. yeah, right. It's a, I think that is a, a, the, another good option. But uh, for this patient, just I'm gonna do balloon. Okay, test. Okay, go. Nominal. Twelve. Fourteen. Fourteen. Safe. Deploy. Okay, this is 4.0. 6, 8. 8. Ten. 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 Okay. Ten. Ten. Deplete. Okay, Jaco. 6, 8, 10. 12, 10, 14, 12, 14, 14, 16. 16. Okay, save. Deplete. Okay, the remain osteum is okay. Go. 6, 8, 10. 10, 14, 14, 16. 14, 16. Okay, deplete. Okay, and then the, we're gonna check the angel again. Okay. Okay, good. So, and the, we just uh, remain the final step. So, the, I'm gonna do additional balloon angioplasty for diagonal branch. And then I apply the drug corridor balloon. It's a 3.5, uh, uh, 30 uh, the millimeter. And then do final kissing and then the finish the procedure. Test. Okay. 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 Point zero. The. Ah, yeah, one, you can. Can. Are you going to do a final IVUS? Yes, uh, the, finally, I'll check again the final IVUS. Definitely. <coughs> it's, uh, in our center, we do more than 95% IVUS guided PCI, the sometimes OCD guided PCI. This is 2.0. It's uh, just compliant balloon for the diagonal branch. I think the diagonal branch is the. Balloon is uh, usually okay. Okay, 이렇게 해놓고 자 놔두고 자 그다음에 DB 줘봐. <웃음> This is uh, the drug corridor balloon, Pantera. B what is it? Second freeze. So we have a uh, two type of the balloon is. Uh, This is uh, 3.5, 3, 30, 30. Prior stand was 30, 30, zero. Okay. I don't want to touch the, the powder portion. Okay. This is final step.
자 여기 딱 디지털 고 오브랩까지 이제 네, 지금 자 여기 요 다이아곤 벤치 요거 먼저 잡고 네. 자 다이, 다이아곤을 한번 가보세요 자 6, 6 8, 8, 8 다이아곤을 10, 10 12, 12 올라가나 오케이 디플릿 안 타셨지? 네. 자한번더 다시 고 다이아곤을 6 8, 8 오케이 자 디플릿 자한번더6 8 8 10 오케이 디플릿 됐어 자 내려놓고 네. 오늘 이제 조금 집어넣고 just push and then the try to 자 디스를 한번 오버랩 됐는데 봅시다 조금 더 나와야 되지 볼게. 오브레 파트 오브 히어. 네. 오케이 여기다. 자, 오케이 고. 노미널. 여기다 세븐. 오케이 타임 온. 세븐. 오케이 타임 온. Just uh, we uh, the wait the uh, 30 seconds. Uh, manufacturer recommendation at least the 35 40 second. And the, we uh, check the viral status in the patient pain and the, some rhythm change. It says. 18 second the 22 <clears throat> okay 30 second one two blood pressure slightly down okay deplete okay and then I'm gonna do the can of call 자, 조금만 더 넣고 자, 같이 갈게. 네. 자, 고. 6 6 6 6 7 7 8 8 8 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 10 Uh, digital part one stand and the REM main part the one stand and then the middle part is a prior ISR region is I just treat the the corridor the balloon okay angel okay. push up okay I think uh, the angiographic result is uh, looks okay yes uh, we're gonna check the IBUS for optimization and the, the for this long part we already do uh, 2.75 non-compliant balloon proximal part we do uh, we did the 4.0 non-compliant balloon is so finally we did the, uh, the long duration the corridor balloon is there any uh, suggestion for another strategy is so initially we think about uh, some reverse technique for treat the diagonal branches uh, but uh, I think uh, We can do that, but the uh, overall procedure would be much, much uh, complex. Uh. <coughs> And uh, you chose uh, drug eluting balloon for the uh, instant to reach stenosis of the uh, bare metal stand. Yeah, right. And uh, okay, another option is you can uh, use a drug eluting stand for the ISR. Mm -hmm. do, uh, do we have any data comparing uh, DEB versus uh, yeah, DES yes. for the... Uh, yeah. Uh, ISR for the uh, <coughs> BMS. Yeah, right. This, uh, you know, some the the bare metal stand. So the the meta analysis is that done. So Stefan Windecker shows the there was a angiographical result was a slightly better with the the giant stand, the rather than the corridor balloon. Is but it, there is no the definite uh, difference in the clinical outcome. We also do. The restore trial is published in the American Heart Journal, but that was a targeting just the drug, drug, the eluding stand ISR. At the time, so we enrolled uh, nearly the 150 cases and the randomization, and the one arm is a giant stand, one arm is a corridor balloon. So overall result was uh, angiographical re result is slightly better was uh, the giant stand, but the clinical outcome was no difference. But I think uh, we can do the additional the stand for the ISR region, but DB is also a good option. Okay. Okay, this is the middle part. Okay, this is the middle part. 
this is a prior stand. Okay, there is some modification of the prior plug. This diffuse region is very difficult to find the optimal landing jump for this LED. <coughs> okay, this is a prior stand. There we can find the, the two stand uh, over here and the uh, proximal yeah. LED. Yeah, right. Proximal yeah. LED. We put the Ultimaster 4.024. Twenty-four. Okay, this is the the sucker is coming. The sucker ostium is widely open. We don't much concern about the sucker ostium gelling at the, during the procedure. Okay, it's a fully covered uh, lemon ostium. Mm. Okay, we check the nitro 한번 주고 네. NG로 한번 다시 찍어 보자. 네. 자. 나이트로 충분히 주고 쭉 찍어 볼게요. 오케이. 네. 엔지오 풀샷 Okay, I think uh, you know some. The this situation is the the I think best I can do. Your, you know, <laughs> it, it looks initiative. excellent. Why don't yeah, you go right. to the uh, array of coder? Okay, okay, array coder. Okay, great. Okay. Ja, enjoy. Ja, push. Okay, Good. great. Good. And then lastly, the spider, and then the, I'm going to finish the procedure. Okay. Great. Okay. Any comment or any suggestion? I think this is a beautiful case. You took a, you, you were very patient. It's kind of a boring uh, way to do it, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you needed to be as persistent as you were with the cutting balloon and Ivis, et, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I wish that everybody would do it so elegantly. Yeah. Okay. Great result. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Rappaport, we see you on the screen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in the, this wonderful cast lab with wonderful people. Uh, do, Dr. You. Kang will uh, describe the, the story of this patient. Yes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This patient is a 73-year-old male patient admitted for the silent ischemia. His chest CT, coronary CT, showed moderate senses at mid-LAD and proximal RCA with calcification. Uh, following coronary angiography showed left main disease with significant stenosis at the proximal to mid LAD. The FFR value of LAD was 0.61. And RCA showed mild disease, so we decided to treat medically. The patient has history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And we will now treat the left main to mid LAD disease and diagonal disease. Okay. Thank you very much. So maybe we can go back to the yep. first uh, images. So this is a lesion of the left man. As you can see, it's uh, uh, 100 zero, zero, or 1.50 uh, uh, zero, uh, lesion. And uh, so this is epicranial uh, uh, areocodal view. And this is epicranial view, oh, sorry. Oh. spider view. But we, we can... Uh, Okay, so in the, this cranial view, you can see uh, the bifurcation between LED and diagonal, uh, which is also significant. The di diagonal branch is not so big, so it's around 2.25 yes. uh, millimeter. Um, maybe we can go to the next one. Next one, spider view. So the spider view show a big angle, but in fact, it was relatively easy to go in this diagonal branch. But you can see in this view a lot of calcification. Uh, in the uh, uh, internal part of the left man. 
Next one. Next. So this is uh, my working view for the left man. And uh, next one, and I will show you the working view for the uh, LED. So it's a more cranial view, uh, which shows very nicely the LED diagonal. What is very interesting is that you can see that in the mid LED there is a bridge. There is a, a bridge, yes. And uh, so we <coughs> want to avoid treating this part with a stent. Uh, because uh, with the bridge, uh, you may have complication, early complication or late complication. So my strategy in this particular case uh, was to treat first uh, LED diagonal branch, which is uh, already done, uh, with a provisional side branch stenting approach, and then we'll focus during the live case on the left man. Yeah. So next. next. So uh, I have wired both branches. Uh, with uh, run-through wires. We have done the predilatation, uh, low pressure with a 3.0 balloon, yeah. non-compliant. Okay, next. next. Then uh, deploy a stent, a 3.0 stent uh, 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 at low pressure again. Next. next. <coughs> then we have done the proximal optimization technique with a 3.25 balloon. Yeah. Next. And of course, we have some carina shifting in the diagonal branch with a subtotal lesion. Uh, maybe uh, if we do FFR, it will be negative, but uh, I prefer to open the strut of this uh, uh, side branch. So next. So I, uh, I remove the wire from the LED. You see that the shape of the wire was done in order to go in the diagonal branch. So this is uh, registered, but uh, it's live. OK, next. Yes. And then we uh, 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 open the strut with a 2.0 balloon at high pressure, yeah. non-compliant. Next. And then we have done a kissing bone inflation with a 2.0 at uh, high pressure and uh, 3.0 at low pressure. Yeah. So this is the final result. Of course, there is. Uh, difference in size between the left uh, stent uh, in the mid uh, LED, but because of the bridge, we don't want to touch um, uh, more distally uh, the, this LED. So now we'll focus on the left man. Uh, so maybe, yeah, so this is a, a working view. And uh, the strategy will be quite the same. So uh, predilatation with a non-compliant balloon to be sure that we really open the, the plaque which is calcified, and then provisional side branch stenting approach. Uh, so we, we can use a non-compliant balloon uh, uh, 3.0. Oh. Oh. Dr. Rappel, uh, have you checked the uh, uh, distal left domain by IBUS? No, 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 no. No, but FFR was uh, 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 0.66. So there is no doubt that uh, we should uh, treat it. Is, have you given any thought to atherectomy of the distal left main? Excuse me? Ha have you given any thought to atherectomy in the distal left main? No, 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 no. Uh, it's um, moderately calcified, so I think it's not, it's not uh, necessary to use a rotablator in this kind of, of case. I think the uh, uh, FFR is uh, significant, uh, but... Uh, I agree with you that the left main disease is significant, but with the IBUS, we can find the uh, actual size of the vessel and we can uh, select the right size. What do you think? So how do you measure the size with the IBUS or OCT? Media to media? I think uh, for me it's relatively clear. We have a 3.5 circ, we have a 3.5 LED, proximal LED. So we know the size of the left man, which is uh, 4.6, if we use a uh, uh, finite slow. So it's relatively uh, simple uh, sizing. Oh, this is a uh, circ, but it's, it's okay. Okay, so now we'll, we'll go to the LED. 
So any different strategy from the panel? It's against the law. It's against the law at this medical center to not use IVUS for a left main. <laughs> So, Jim, uh, how do you measure the, the, the reference diameter with IVUS? Yeah, please. Well, you know, there's different diameters at different points on the artery, and that has to be a subjective decision. But exactly. um, there's a lot more of the information than just the size, both before, during, and after the, um, the procedure. So, at the end of it, we plan to do at the end of the procedure uh, an OCT to check uh, the result test and especially to check that we have a fully a position of the stent uh, proximally and distally. Okay, you can go to, so it's 3-0, uh, non-compliant? Okay. okay, you can go to high pressure, 16. So I just want to be sure that uh, we have really opened the, this plaque. Okay, you can go to 20 atmosphere. Is that 35? Uh, 30. 30. Okay, off. 30 by 50. Oh, you can see clearly that uh, this vessel is, uh, is a 35 uh, vessel. Huh? So the LED. Okay, so we can uh, inject. <coughs> okay, so now we uh, will select a stent. So what I want to, I want to be sure that I will uh, cover the ostium, which is a little bit disease. So this is uh, 15 millimeter? Yes, 15. So I think we need uh, 20, uh, 28. Or how about... Uh, how, how much? 30. Okay, we'll use a 30. Uh, so uh, we select on extent. Um, as you know, the, the sizing is very important, so we know that the 3 onyx is not the same as a 3.5. So the 3.5 can go up to uh, 4.8 or 5.0. So I think it will be okay for this uh, big uh, left man. Yeah, 3.5, 30. So, uh, does the panel agree that uh, we can use a provisional cyber stenting approach in this case? Yes. Okay, so now we have a 3.5, uh, 30. What I will do is to go in a <coughs> cranial view to check that we are really uh, uh, covering the ostium. A test. Okay, so you see that we have. Uh, usually, when you go in uh, areocodal, you miss the ostium. Okay, test. Test again. <coughs> Test. 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 Okay. So this is good. It's very important uh, to be careful with the. Uh, so the marker of the balloon is not the position of the stent. Uh, so very. <laughs> So that's why I'm making a good injection. Test. 
Okay, so I think it looks good. What, what do you think? <coughs> yes, exactly. Okay. So we can make a cine in this view. Okay. Do, do you have uh, side holes in this uh, yes. catheter? Or? Yeah, we have side holes. Ah, okay, I understand. So how about do the check by ileocranial? No, the problem is that there is side holes on this catheter, so you inject uh, a big part uh, outside uh, of the lumen. Okay, tests. Okay, so uh, I'm more selective, so it will be... Okay, so you see uh, here we are too much distal. Test again. Okay. So we make a cine like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you can uh, you can deploy. Uh, okay, we can go okay. to can yes. Nominal pressure is twelve. Twelve, yeah. Yep. 12. So we can go to 12 atmosphere, checking that uh, we have really a good opening of the stent. Okay. Uh, you can go to 14. 14. And we can prepare a 4.5 uh, semi-compliant balloon, short one, to do the proximal optimization. Yes. Okay, deflation. So now it's very important to be careful with, uh, because there is one wire which is outside in the circ and one wire which is inside. So this uh, 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 part of the procedure where we can do uh, longitudinal compression. So it's very important uh, to, full of, to wait for a full deflation of the balloon and to have a good control with your left hand of the guiding catheter in order not to uh, push the stents. Okay. So we can do uh a good angiogram in this view. Okay. So of course uh, the size of the the size of the stent is too small. So we uh, we need to do a proximal optimization technique, and then of course there will be a debate: uh, what should we do in the circ? Because uh, probably angiographically the result on the circ will be good. Is the 4.5 coming or? 4.5? Yeah. Hmm? 10 or 8? 10, 10 is okay. Uh, yeah, so I think it's, uh, for me, uh, it's very important to open uh, the strut of this uh, stand toward the circ because it's a very big circ, 3.5. But uh, some people are not doing this. And today we have no randomized study showing one technique is better than the other one. So the, this is a 4.5 uh, 10 balloon, semi-compliant? Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, so we'll, uh, so very important to position the balloon at the right place, close to the carina. <coughs> And the only view uh, in, uh, for left man to be close to the carina is a spider view. So, uh, okay, so I will use the spider and check that we are really uh, at the right place. Injection. 
Okay. What do you think? Good. Is there okay. 4.5? Yes, 4.5. 4.5, yes. So we are really at the level of the Carena. Okay, you can go to 10. You see, usually the balloon is moving a little bit back. You can go to 14. 14. Okay. To 4.56. Okay. Off. Now I will treat the proximal part, of course. Uh, 16. <coughs> 16. Eighteen. Eighteen. Okay. Off. And now we'll uh, treat the the ostium. Okay. Twenty. Twenty. Four point seven five. Okay. Off. So you see, uh, uh, the hemodynamic is uh, very good. There is no. Uh, Drop in the pressure. So now we have really a good opposition proximal to the bifurcation, and we'll check in uh, in the area of view, yes. area codal that we have a good uh, result. <laughs> Okay, so now we have still some residual lesion at the uh, level of the calcification uh, that will be solved by the kissing body inflation, I think. <coughs> so there is no carina shifting uh, visible in this view. So what we can do is to use the third wire. So what is your opinion? Will you stop at this level or will you move to a... Uh, Opening the struts. You mean the silk? Yeah. <coughs> At the beginning, the uh, it looks like uh, it looked like uh, there was no uh, significant disease at the ostium of circumflex. Yeah, it's true. And uh, at this stage, we see the uh, uh, circumflex ostium is widely open. And. Yeah. Uh, why don't you e examine the uh, lesion with IBUS? Uh, probably through the, uh, uh, from the LAD and from the CERC, if necessary. Uh, this is Dr. Cho from Taipei. Uh, I suggest you use the uh, OCT right now to check the uh, distal uh, LAD stand if there is a uh, edge dissection because uh, from the angiogram you see there is a uh, diameter jump. And also, you can uh, use OCT to guide how to uh, wire the distal uh, uh, hole of the uh, uh, stand and to the, do the good uh, uh, case balloon technique to prevent the uh, infusion DSISR. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, you are probably both right. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the uh, uh, real. F uh, uh, the rheology is not optimal when we leave uh, struts in front of the of the circ like that. So no, no, do not inject. Uh, and uh, so that's why I prefer to open the strut, do a good kissing manipulation because we'll uh, improve the result in the LED with high pressure, non-compliant balloon, and also in the okay test. I think we are in small branch. I oh, know. Okay, so maybe we can do an injection here to check that uh, we are. So we are in a mid strut. I think it's uh, very acceptable. Okay, so we we'll use a 3.5 uh, non compliant balloon.
And at the end, we will do an OCT just to be sure that everything is okay. So I'm removing the gel wire from the circ. Okay. So did you feel resistance when you bring back the trapped wire? Uh, yes, some resistance, but you saw that the guiding catheter was not moving, so it was really uh, very uh, little. In our daily clinical practice, we always uh, get an OCT image at this point because uh, the position of the wire uh, from left main to SAC, we have to change the position nearly 30% based on the OCT data. So yeah. at this point, uh, OCT might be helpful. Yeah, but you, you, you saw that uh, I, I have made the CNA showing that the wire is a uh, mid position, <coughs> it's not a proximal strut, and because it's a T shape angulation, I think it's a very. Uh, So maybe we are going outside, I don't know. So I will uh, try again. I think, do you use uh, side all systematically when you treat a left man? Yes. Yeah, okay, so I never use it. Okay, so I want really to be sure that I am inside the stand and then by pulling back the wire from uh, the LED will try to enter a distal strut test. I think this is a good uh, demonstration. If the, you have any resistance with the balloon, the wire may have gone to the outside of the stand. That's why Dr. Lepov removes the original wire yeah. and try again. Exactly. Test. test. Okay, you see now we are really uh, in a better position, so we make a CNA just for you. So do you think that we need uh, <coughs> OCT to be sure that we are in the distal strut? Yes. We have OCT expert here. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, okay. So now we are, I will try again to push my balloon. Uh, it's very strange because we are, it's a GL. <coughs> and the GL does not give you a very good support. Okay, test. Okay, so we can inflate here. You can go to 12. So I don't want to uh, damage the circ, so we just uh, treat the ostium. You can go to, it's very big, uh, to uh, 16. 16. So angiographically, wire root is very much distal part okay, of the off. skin strut. It's good. And we need another 3.5 yes, for the LED. This is the LED. So what we, we can do an angio now if you want. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay. So uh, are we, uh, after that we will do OCT, are we ready to do OCT or? Yes, yeah, okay. So I will do the kissing and then we will do the, uh, the OCT. Because I think that we are close to the, the end of the transmission. Thank you. So we have checked uh, ACT also during, uh, at the beginning of the procedure. It was four, 440. Yes. So we are confident that uh, we have a good anticoagulation. Okay, so now we can go to high pressure with uh, LED. So you can go to 18, 18, 20, 22. Okay, so we have a very good expansion of the, of the balloon. Okay, off. Now we'll do the kissing by inflation. So I will start 
So what I want in order to avoid the circularization, uh, uh, ovalization of the stent, I just put the two balloons only in the polygon of confluence, make a test. Okay. Okay, so we can uh, go uh, to the circ first. Fast, okay. Fast. Uh, 12, 12, and you can go to 16 in the LED. LED 16. Okay. Oh, uh, deflation boss, yeah. yeah. So the balloon moved a little bit uh, distally. So um, tell us what you did to avoid ovalization of the stent. So I, I, I have the, the two balloons which are only in the polygon of confluence. So I, I want to have the two balloons like, like that uh, because uh, then you uh, ovalize the stent and you need to do a final pot. So uh, uh, in this case lab, there is no short balloons non-compliant. So I use one balloon in a position and the other one in the other position in order not to have overlap of the two balloons proximally. So we'll do another kissing. Uh, Okay, start with the circ at 12 uh -huh. and uh, 10 in the LED. Okay. Okay, off. Yes. Okay. So we'll do the OCT in, uh, in the LED. <coughs> oh, this one. Yeah. So this is the LED. Okay, so while we are preparing OCT, we'll do uh, an angio. Okay. Okay. So I think now we have a good deployment of the stents. And we'll give you the uh, the OCT right now. Any comment or question? Excellent result. We just want to see the uh, yeah. image. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. There's OCT ready to LED. Yeah. Uh, how, how much uh, you inject for OCT? Usually a three point, a thirty-five milliliter, milliliter, twenty to thirty. What? How? But uh, how, how many cc per second? Uh, two. Yeah. How much? I think it's the most important. We will inject about thirty, thirty cc. Yeah. yeah. But how much per second? So maybe better to use a guide extension to close off the side hole of the guiding. <laughs> Good point. Uh, yeah, I think it's very important to have uh, at least 5.5 cc per second in this uh, big left man, or even 6 cc per second. So if you want to have good uh, images. So how much do we have? How much CC per second? Oh, 650. We will use. 650. No, but uh, no. CC per second. CC per second. Uh, the rate. How much? Five, four? Six. Six million. Six. OK, perfect. OK, good. Um, we can make a pullback how much we can do? Uh, 50 or 75. Okay, 50, I think it's enough. So we can see the LED stand also. 
Okay. Okay. Ready? It's okay? Yes, it's okay. We are all ready. Already? Yeah. Start. Can you please <coughs> show the first copy? We usually do that. Up start. Start. Can you make that OCT screen large for us, please? Okay. So have you seen the uh, images? OCT를 크게 보여주세요. Good. Okay. So maybe we can ask to the specialist of OCT in the in the panel to come on. Dr. Kasaka. Uh, yes. Please show <laughs> me. Uh, here is a bifurcation, right? Some tissue, yeah. yeah. Some tissue protrusion. Right. Here is a distal. Yeah, we can identify some a crack in the distal. Yes, this is the distal. Yeah, yeah. distal edge landing zone. We can identify some crack. It might be okay. Very small yes. crack. Yes. Small crack. Yeah, and right. we move forward. Yeah. Uh, nearly symmetric, and uh, the position is very fine. This is, is branch. Now no, yeah. we have seen the yeah. bifurcation. Yeah, branch. Branch is okay. Mm. Okay, yeah. Here is a proximal LED. And here, yes. yeah. Here is left main. Sorry. Yeah, left main. And please move a little bit distal. Yes. Yes, you can identify some tissue protrusion opposite to the uh, CX, right? Yeah. 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 A small amount of tissue protrusion here, right? And this, yeah, yeah. here we have a very nice opening of the strut toward the circ. Yes, yes. Right. And we will move to left main. Mm -hmm. And this is the left main yeah. shaft. Yeah. Very eccentric plug, so, right? Yeah. Yeah, looks fine. And here. It yeah, might be very difficult to identify yes. the strut, but uh, some strut in uh, yes, 6 to 7 o'clock, yeah. some, some strut. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yes. So I think we will do a, a post dilatation at this uh, level. Yes, yes. Okay. But generally speaking, uh, the result is very fine, except for uh, the, the, the proximal uh, incomplete opposition, right? Okay, yes, yes, I fully agree. So we'll use uh, a 4.5 balloon and uh, do yes. a post-dilatation uh, at this level. So maybe, uh, I think we are running a little bit late, so maybe uh, we'll be... Uh, or do you want to see the, the post dilatation? Okay, Dr. Lefova, it was an excellent demonstration. Uh, you are going to uh, uh, finish with the uh, uh, balloon inflation to uh, establish the complete yes. position? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I'd like to congratulate the excellent result. And we, thank you. we are going to have a lecture session here. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, bye bye. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to invite Dr. Kubon, uh, Dr. Bungongo. Uh, he is going to give a lecture uh, regarding uh, IFR as the gold standard index. Dr. Gu, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Bach, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, I have uh, actually a significant conflict of interest with this talk because I measure both resting and hyperemic index in all cases. And as of now, most of my physiology guide decision is based on FFR in daily practice. So discordance matters, but it's everywhere. So in our field, and when you see the, the panels, you will see also there's discordance. But the problem is that we all know that the panels are excellent, distinguished operators and scientists, but 
generally, it is in discordances interpreted in terms of superiority and inferiority concept. That's the problem we have. So here is a scatter plot between IFR and FFR. It's good to see the concordant normal and concordant abnormal, but as usual, there are discordances. So if there's only one truth, actually discordance has no meaning. So these have no meaning because if there's only one truth. So when we divided those scatter plots into four groups according to the concordant normal, concordant abnormal, and discordance, if FFR is only the single truth, so there's no meaning of uh, discrimination of these group two, three according to the IFR. So that the group one, normal, group four, abnormal, so there's no difference between group and two, one and two, and three and four in terms of percent diameter stenosis, lesion length, syntax score, and FFR. But if you see the truth, there's a difference between group and two and three in, term, uh, in comparison with the group one and group four for percent diameter stenosis, lesion characteristics, patient lesion severity, and functional significance. So this illustrates there is some clinical and physiological relevance of this discordance. But we generally use this uh, discordance uh, uh, interpreting as this way. So if there is a, using FFR as a gold standard, as accuracy is only 80%, we generally interpret this result as IFR is inferior to FFR by 20%. So this is not the matter of truth, but actually how we interpret this discordance, and uh, that's the matter. So what is the gold standard? So it's that actually this is, is from the Cambridge Dictionary, and this is not about good and bad. Actually, this is very good and good other similar thing. So I took the liberty to change this uh, title as why FFR is not a single only gold standard index. So having said that, let's think about the prerequisites for a newcomer so that the, the new one should be user-friendly and less or no side effect, and there should be some scientific background. Of course, there should be clinical data, and it should be, have some cost-saving and cost-effectiveness, of course. So let's start up the user-friendly and side effect issues. So here's a mid-LAD intermediate stenosis, I would say around 60%. So it's good to measure FFR for this case, FFR 0.81, so it's very nice. But for this measurement, you have to connect the adenosine, infuse, wait for at least 34, sometimes one and a half a minute, and patient may have chest discomfort and AV block. But IFR, just one click, you can have this number in two to three seconds. So there is no doubt that the IFR is having fewer side effects and reduce the procedure time. So the, it's period. So what about the scientific background? So we know about the very, uh, this scientific background about hyperemia very well, and the problem of understanding the resting index is the myth that there's no change in resting flow as the stenosis severity increases. So some people believe that as there's no change in uh, flow according to the stenosis severity, any resting index cannot represent the stenosis severity. But the truth is that the, as the stenosis severity increases, there's an increase in my, my, uh, micro, decrease in microvascular resistance, and this increased transtenotic pressure gradient, even the resting status. But, but there's a dis difference in stiffness, so that the, the stiffness matters, but even the resting pressure gradient can represent the stenosis severity. So this is a fundamental physiology of during coronary circulation. So that steepness difference matters. So if we scatter the changes of IFR according to percent diameter stenosis and FFR, you see that the FFR cutoff meets less stenosis severe lesion than the uh, IFR cutoff. So how, this represents why the, in the defined flare and IFR sweetheart study, IFR guided strategy was uh, ended up with less revascularization. As you can see here, less number of stents, less PCI, less bypass surgery. So it's good that the IFR guide strategy is due to its uh, uh, insensitiveness to the stenosis severity, it will end up with less stent. But what we're concerned is about the outcome. So less stent is good, but the outcome is the same. So why not we use this rather less sensitive index to have a similar outcome with the more, more stents? And let's move on, move on to the, another some uh, scientific background and cost-effectiveness issue. 
So I already mentioned that if you use the FFR as a gold standard, there's no way that the IFR can prove its superiority to FFR. So that's the reason we need a right judge for this decision. So there can be several others, but I think that the PET scan, which can provide relatively perfusion decrease, stress flow, rest flow, and corner reserve may be the best one and to give a right answer and right decision. So when we use a corner flow reserve, which is a very classical uh, a definition to define ischemia from PET as a gold standard, so red, line, red bars, FFR, and blue bars, IFR, you can see there's no statistical difference between FFR and IFR, and numerically, actually, IFR is better in terms of CFR, and this result matches well with the, the other group's data that the, when there's a discordance, IFR correlates well with the CFR. But if you use the relatively flow reserve, which is more closer definition to the FFR, you see that still there's no statistically significant difference, but the numerically FFR matters. FFR is better. So it doesn't matter which is better or which is worse, but actually it matters which one do you want to use as a gold standard. So it, again, it's a, a matter of interpretation, but not the superiority and inferiority. But what we need to concern is association with the clinic outcome. So here is the association of the estimated event rates and the value of resting PDPA, IFR, and FFR. But as you can see here, all these three resting hyperemic indices have a significant association with risk. So no matter whether it's resting PDPA, IFR, FFR, when the value is low, event rate risk can be higher. And we already have uh, this uh, nice two big randomized study which showed that the, which proved the non-inferiority of the IFR guided strategy compared to the FFR guided strategy. So I, I can say we have enough evidence. In terms of discordance again, so when you follow the outcomes of patients who have a concordant normal, discordance and concordant abnormal, if there's no meaning in these IFR discrimination, actually this group should have around this area. But as you can see here, only the concordant of normal has a, a statistically very significant difference in terms of risk and there's no significant difference in these groups. So that the discordance matters and concordance uh, discordance matters. In about cost saving, as mentioned earlier, IFR-based uh, procedure is associated with shorter procedure duration, no hyperemic medication, lower PCI rates, fewer cabbage procedure, and fewer unplanned PCI in LAD. So no doubt that the IFR procedure is associated with the significantly lower cost with IFR. So there is a huge debate between FFR and IFR in terms of which is better and which is worse. I, but, but actually, in terms of academic achievement, both had a great achievement, but I think that the ugly fact is hidden here. So this is, this is the kind of report, 2014 Korean PCI registry, so that the ugly fact on this physiology volume is that the use of FFR is only 3.7%. So it's only 3.7%, and this is the ugly fact. And another way interpreting this discordance is that the physiology, which is meaning the nature and origin of, of a living creature and coronary physiologic index. So here is a relatively small vessel, IFR 0.75, significant FFR 0.85. So in terms of, from my personal experience, I would say this may not be functionally significant so that I can decide that the IFR is wrong, FFR is right. But if you see the patient history, the patient has dyspnea, chest discomfort, has a lung cancer surgery, COPD, stomach cancer. So IFR is bad for the patient, FFR says good for the patient, but in terms of patient outcome, which do you think is more accurate and more right, uh, adequate to reflect the patient's status in that perspective? So why FFR is not a single and only gold standard index? I think both FFR and IFR are smart and useful physiologic indexes, and integrated use will maximize the benefit of invasive physiologic assessment. And the goal is not to prove which is good or gold standard, but to increase the use of physiologic guided clinical decision in daily practice. And my simple answer to this question is, two is better than one. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Gu. We are going to have a discussion after Dr. An's lecture. Uh, he's ready for give a lecture from Assam Medical Center. Dr. Hello. 
Yes, this is Jungmin An from Asan Medical Centers. My side is FFR is the golden standard. So the, any kind of, uh, 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 both, uh, both index have a very si sound scientific basis. The Nico Pulse already published it uh, the, uh, 20 year, almost 20 years ago. So then I want to say how to detect the objective ischemia. FFR and IFR <laughs> can measure the, uh, the, uh, theoretically decrease coronary blood flow, but decrease of coronary blood flow is not enough. Due to this coronary blood flow, there is some abnormality in myocardial perfusion. It could be detected by the thallium spec or contractile abnormality, double time stress echo, or ECG change and treatment test or other stress test. So ammonium PET scan could be the golden standard to detect coronary blood flow, but coronary blood flow is not the means of myocardial ischemia. So ammonium PET scan is not golden standard to detect myocardial ischemia, I want to say. So initially, the FFR ischemic threshold 0.75 was validated against the three different non-invasive functional studies through ischemic test, stress echo, thallium spec, exercise test. Cut off value is 0.75. So we can say the FFR ischemic threshold it would be the 0.75, then FFR would be a non, could be a non-invasive functional study in the cath lab. So in this study, patient number is 45, sensitive, specificity, positive, and negative predictive value is very nice. In addition, then, this is ischemic threshold could be translated to the outcome-derived revascularization threshold. So last year, we published the data. The, about 5,000 patients we measured, uh, we evaluated the maze according to the uh, FFR category. More than 0 0.90, between 0 0.86, 0 0.90, 0 0.81, 0 0.85, 0 0.76, 0 0.80, 0 0.71, 0 0.75, less than 0 0.70. Red bar is a revascularized region event. Blue bar, different region event. According to the category of FFR, high FFR different region low event, but low FFR different region event is very high. Interestingly, revascularized region event is very constant. So this intersection of two hazard curve is located at the point seven nine. This is a very close to the contemporary revascularization threshold FFR 0.80. So this our findings support that the FFR cutoff value would be the ischemic threshold and the outcome derived revascularization threshold. This is a very important advantage of FFR cutoff value. So FFR guided PCI, what it is. According to the revascularization threshold, less than 0.80, the myocardial ischemic producing lesion, so stenting justified. More than 0.80, no myocardial ischemia producing, so initially optimal medical treatment was recommended deferral of stenting. Less than 0.80 FFR, stenting justified, based on FAME2 random trial. They randomized uh, two strategies, medication and FFR-guided PCI in patients with stable angina with uh, the st coronary stenosis <coughs> of FFR less than 0.80, the up to two-year follow-up. The initially, PCI showed a higher risk due to the periprocedural myocardial infarction, but less than, uh, more after one week, FFR-guided PCI significantly reduced the risk of death or, or myocardial infarction. PBL is significant. So based on FAME2 trial, less than, FFR less than 0 0.80 stenting justified. In addition, the different trial, this is a five-year outcome, recently 15-year outcome. When you differed according to the FFR, 
in this study, FFR cutoff value is 0 0.75. Anyway, different region outcome is better than performed region outcome. So FFR more than 0 0.80 should be different. Then, using this kind of strategy, we call it FFR guided PCI, was validated in a FAME 1 random trial. They compared the FFR guided PCI and angel guided PCI up to five years. FFR guided PCI showed a very favorable clinical outcome with less use of a stent. Then this kind of random trial should be replaced in the real world practice. So Asam PCR registry reproduced the random trial result. So after routine use of FFR, base rate, test MI repeat intervention significantly reduced. One year outcome already published. This year, <laughs> we follow the five year death MI repeat intervention clinical benefit maintained up to five year. In addition, whole period stand number is before routine use of FFR 2.2, after routine use of FFR 1.6. So if you use the FFR routinely in your clinical practice, you can obtain the very favorable patient outcome with the less use of a stand. So random trial research reproduced in the real world practice. In addition, FFR <coughs> value itself showed that the pro uh, have a prognostic value. This is a risk continuum. So lower, lower FFR value, higher risk. So same finding was repro reproduced in our registry data according to the FFR, high FFR, low FFR, there is a gradient of risk. How about the measurement? First the measurement FFR and second measure FFR, very reproducible. In addition, probability of revascular uh, decision will change if measurement is repeated the error range is very narrow. One more thing, the racing PDPA and FFR or IFR and FFR, we can <coughs> group the four different categories. When you plot, this is our registry data, not published, but the clinical outcome is different according to the different group. Both normal, best result, but either normal both no, of no, either of normal, both of normal show the higher risk compared to the both normal. So without hyperemia, just when you use when, when when you just use the resting index, this clinical important subset with moderately but significantly increased risk of cardiac event. Yes, this red dot line could not be identified. This is my summary. Yes, FFR has a sound scientific basis, and cutoff value of FFR was validated against the ischemic test and recently clinical outcome. FFR guided PCA was validated in the random trials and real world registry, favorable outcomes with less extent use. FFR has a prognostic value and highly reproducible. In addition, Induction of hyperemia can identify the unique clinical, physiologic, and prognostic phenotype of patient. So I'd like to say FFR would be the golden standard in the cath lab. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, now these lectures are open for discussion. Dr. Magulis. Thank you. I'm going to um, make some points. Um, neither F FFR, neither IFR or FFR are gold standards. Uh, the predictive accuracy of these tools is uh, somewhere between 0.8 and 0.9, probably more closer to 0.8. If you, uh, you, if you had gold in your repository that was only 80% pure, you would not consider that the gold standard. Um, this is important because um, FFR is so much used now that it's, it's, it's a decision-making um, tool. An FFR of 0.81 says you don't do a case, and a FFR of 0.79 says you do. And that's, of course, ridiculous. Uh, it depends on the clinical history. And the second point is, 
that uh, Andreas Grinzig never suggested that his procedure was one to save lives. It was a treatment for angina. It still is a treatment for angina, and except in acute myocardial infarction, we don't have evidence that it does or does not save lives. So we're, we're, FFR is a very good tool. It's, it's been proven over time to be fairly accurate, but it is not a gold standard, and we need to use clinical decision-making in the conjunction with FFR to take care of our patients. Thank you for the comment. Dr. An, you have any uh, additional comment on that? Yes, I fully agree with your opinion, but uh, the, we have to know that uh, FFR cutoff value 0.80 is a very uh, strict cutoff value. Yes, clinical judgment is very important, but sometimes we need a very objective scale, which one, uh, which is good, the other is bad. Then we have to fully understand that this nature and on the basis of this nature, the, we need to do the further clinical judgment. Any other questions or comments from the panelists? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, Both uh, uh, advantage and disadvantage, right? Uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ku said, uh, the IFR can be easily used without hyperemia. And it might be uh, very useful, especially in case with uh, tandem region, serial stenosis, which might be more significant. Uh, we can identify very easily. And as uh, Dr. Maguri said, FFR, IFR also uh, not a gold standard. It's in one of the index to uh, decide the PCI or uh, medical treatment. And uh, the cutoff value is 0 0.80, might be uh, one of the index to treat or not treat. As uh, Dr. An said, a 0.75 is at the moment uh, it might be the gold standard for ischemia, but if we use a 0.75, we miss some patient. Therefore, they always think about the uh, gray zone 0.75 and 0.80. But uh, as uh, Dr. An demonstrated, uh, if we think about the, the uh, event rate and FFR value, uh, medical treatment and uh, PCI or revascularization, cross point is around 0.80. That means if you develop a much better PCI, the cross point may move to the 0.82 or 0.83. And if you make a uh, much better medical treatment, cross point may move to the 0.78 or 76. It depends on the, the, the development of treatment. Therefore, uh, as uh, the Dr. Magoris pointed out, it, it is not a gold standard and the, the index uh, might be if not a fixed value, it may depend on the, the medical condition. It's my comment. Weda, Weda from Osaka National Hospital. I agree with Dr. Maori's comments. And uh, first of all, the most important thing is that FFR or uh, IFR is not uh, to find whether ischemia is there or not. There, there is small to large ischemia. So the lower value of FR or IFR means the uh, larger ischemia. So when, at which point we should treat it or not depends on many other factors. For example, the patient has very progressive lesions, so why don't you wait till next year, treat it now, to if the values are at the border lines. Otherwise, when, if the patient had no symptom and no necessity otherwise, then why don't you leave it as it is and treat medically and uh, let them uh, have the better lesion next year. So at the borderline, the value 0 0.8 or what doesn't mean so much and we should uh, consider other factors and decide whether or not treat it or not. Don't treat the patient if he has 0 0.97 and do not add 0 0.81. It's very nonsense. Dr. Wu, please come up to the podium. And uh, Dr. An said that FFR is still the golden standard. Uh, do you think uh, IFR will replace the FFR in the future? Uh, I, I personally think that it's, it's each operator's preference. 
so that the, I still prefer. So my preference is to use both. All the time I measure both and I integrate both information. As, 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 as discussed now, I think that the FFR has been the gold standard for decision making for it's better than NGO. But basically, I'm not in the cat lab to measure the FFR for my decision. I'm in the cat lab to have a clinical information, NGO information, and when needed, I edit the information of whether it is IFR and FFR. So that's my uh, comment for that previous discussion point. And my second point is that the IFR represents the resting status, FFR hyperemic status. So we think ischemia is very important in the decision making for the revascularization, but in, term, in terms of general risk profile of the patient, whole patients, I think it is also very important to understand the resting status. Because except Dr. An and Dr. Mi, all of you are in resting status. So we are in a little bit hyperemic status. <laughs> so that the, this why this is resting status is also very important in our clinical condition. And that's the reason why we need a, a IFR. It's not a matter of which is the best and who is the killer and which will be uh, vanished away in a few years. But I think it's, it's nice to have, a, we are going to have a IFR, DPR, RFR, all those different resting indices in this year as well. So it's good that you can choose resting PDPA, IFR, RFR, FF, and all those indices for assessing the resting status of the patient. Well, well, I, I have one question, the Dr. Gu. The, you, you said that the resting index, IFR is resting index, but I don't agree with the, uh, the IFR is resting index. The IFR is a hyperemia free index or attention free index. Cutoff value 0.89 is corresponding to the hyperemic FFR 0.80. So IFR 0.89 is not resting status value mimicking the hyperemia without, uh, without adenosine. Right, but anyway, it's resting value measured at rest, so that it doesn't mean but, that the, so it's a surrogate of ischemia, but the yeah. matter is whether that really uh, interpret and represent the status so that the, we know that type A personality patients will have a higher heart rate, and high blood pressure, there's no resting. So assuming that the, if the patient who have a 50% stenosis, type A personality, IFR positive, FFR negative, but we all know that those patients have a very higher risk of the cardiovascular events than the others. So that in that case, which is better index for the patients, not for the decision making for the, whether we do a PCI or not. So that the, I would say that the, for the, PCI, for the PCI or not, maybe FFR may be the better index, but the, for the patient outcome analysis and prediction of total patient outcome, which is far more best, better to the patient and their families, I think that the resting in understanding of resting status is also important. Well, well but you know, the, the truth is, if you look back at the history of interventional cardiology, it's very hard to think of any case where the easier to use technique didn't ultimately win out and become the accepted technique. So we will probably have this debate for several more years, but I think interventional cardiologists are going to vote with their feet and are likely to choose the technique that's easier to use if they're perceived as being close to equivalent. Thank you. I think uh, we have a lot of discussion to do, but uh, for the time, uh, Thank you very I'd much. like to close this session. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, all the faculties, audience. <laughs> Thank you.